Let me uh, introduce you to a woman named Ayan. Ayan is a, a part of a people who, who pride themselves on being 100% Muslim. To belong to Ayan's tribe is to be Muslim. Ayan's personal identity, familial honor, relational standing, and social status are intertwined with Islam. Simply put, if Ayan ever leaves her faith, she will immediately lose her life. If Ayan's family ever finds out that she is no longer Muslim, they will kill her without question or hesitation. Now imagine having a conversation with Ayan about Jesus. You start by telling her how God loves her so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for her sins as her savior. And as you speak, you can sense her heart softening toward what you're saying. And at the same time, you can detect her spirit trembling as she contemplates what it will cost her to follow Jesus. And with fear in her eyes and faith in her heart, she asks you, how do I become a Christian? And you have two options in your response to Ian. You can tell her how easy it is to become a Christian. If Ian will simply assent to certain truths about Jesus and repeat uh, a particular prayer, she can be saved. That's all it takes. Your second option is to tell Ian the truth. You can tell Ian that in the gospel, God is calling her to die, literally to die to her life, to die to her family, to die to her friends, to die to her future. And in dying, to live, to live in Jesus, to live as part of a global family that includes every tribe, to live with friends who span every age, to live in a future where joy will last forever. Ayan is not imaginary. She is a real woman who made a real choice to become a Christian, no matter what it cost her. Because of her decision, she was forced to leave her family and become isolated from her friends. Yet she now works strategically and sacrificially for the spread of the gospel among her people. The risk is high every day as she dies to herself all over again in order to live for Christ. Ian's story is a clear reminder to us that the initial call to Christ is an inevitable call to die. And as we begin a new year, I, I want us to consider the fact that the call to discipleship is not a call to a life, a life of ease and comfort. Nothing could be further from the truth. In reality, the call to discipleship is a call to a more difficult, more challenging life. It's a call to die so that we may find true life in Christ. And yet some today, unwilling to accept a call to die, simply walk away or change Jesus' message to something more pleasant. But Jesus never guaranteed a pleasant life. A, a passage that I've been meditating on a lot lately is Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 27. Please turn there in your Bibles with me. If you're using one of the Bibles here in our auditorium, you can find that on page 670. I'd also encourage you to find the sermon notes inside of your program and Take those out and use them as a guide as we study this passage together this morning. In these verses, Jesus tells us about the true cost of discipleship. Follow along as I read, beginning with verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Note that in verse 24, Jesus gives three requirements for someone who seeks to be one of his disciples. First, they must deny themselves. Second, they must take up their cross. And third, they must follow him. And it's important that we understand what's involved with each of these requirements because Jesus says that we are not truly his disciples unless we are meeting these requirements. Look again at verse 24. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And in Luke chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, I'm going to be out of town next Sunday, but today, and then again in in two weeks, I want to examine these three requirements of discipleship with you in a little more detail. This morning's message is titled, The Way of the Cross, A Call to Die. And we will be looking at the first two requirements Jesus gave for discipleship, to deny yourself and to take up your cross. Then in two weeks, we will look at Jesus' third requirement to follow him. Notice in verse 24 that Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, probably the 12, men who already were followers of Jesus. Why why would Jesus speak these words to them? Well, we, we need to understand the context in which these words were given Looking a little bit back in in chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, we see Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. That This is probably the central passage in the entire book of Matthew. And when Peter spoke these words, he was speaking on behalf of the twelve. So they've all come to understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That their doubt regarding his person has disappeared. The result of two plus years of seeing all of his miracles and listening to all of his teachings and living with him 24-7. This is a great euphoric moment of divine revelation and clarity. And then in verse 21, we have Jesus' prediction of his death. He says to the 12 that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And then finally, in verses 22 and 23, we have Jesus' confrontation of Peter. Why would Jesus need to confront Peter? The disciples' view of the Messiah was that he was going to come and establish a kingdom, that he was going to save all of Israel and make Israel the most powerful nation in the world. Consequently, when Jesus predicted his death, it was contrary to everything that they believed, everything that they had hoped for, everything that they expected. And so Peter, once again, speaking on behalf of the 12, says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And to Peter's shock, Jesus says to him directly, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And with these words, Jesus reveals an important truth. That man is only interested in blessing, but God requires the cross. It's true, isn't it? There will be no kingdom. There will be no blessing. There will be no glory without the cross. If there's no sacrifice for sin, 
And so Jesus says, I am going to die. And in saying this, he goes on to say, and by the way, if you follow me, there's a cross for you too. And Jesus is helping Peter and the others to understand the cost of discipleship, the type of commitment needed to follow him. And so I want us to look at the first two requirements that Jesus gives to those that would seek to be his disciple. And while these words were spoken to the 12, I believe, Jesus begins verse 24 by saying, whoever wants to be my disciple. So again, these requirements apply to anyone who wants to be a follower of Jesus, including us today. So what does it mean to deny yourself? Well, first of all, let's talk about what it does not mean. It does not mean that you must deny your personality as a distinct individual. Jesus does not expect you to simply view yourself as a member of his church while ignoring your individual identity. We, we know that every person is a unique creation of God with unique thoughts, unique, a unique temperament, and unique abilities. We, we also know that the, our Heavenly Father knows each of His children by name and that each of our names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so God treats us as individuals and He would not expect us to deny our own personhood. Second of all, you must, it does not mean that you must deny yourself of all forms of earthly pleasure. Uh, another word for this is asceticism. The monks during the uh, uh, medieval times practiced asceticism. That they, they lived uh, reclusively and they abstained from exotic foods and drinks and from sexual pleasure. And some may think that this is what Jesus is saying, that we need to deny ourselves of all forms of earthly pleasure, but that's not true. Because the Bible tells us that food and drink are good gifts from God when enjoyed in moderation. Scripture also tells us that sex is a good gift from God when practiced within the confines of a covenant marriage relationship. And so Jesus wouldn't expect his followers to deny or abstain from the good gifts that his heavenly father has given us. It can't be talking about that. So what does it mean to deny yourself? It means simply that you must die to self. The Greek word that is translated deny means to completely disown, to utterly separate oneself from someone. It's the same Greek verb that Jesus used when informing Peter that before night's end, he will have denied him three times. Each time that Peter was confronted about his relationship to Jesus, he vehemently denied knowing him. Now, Jesus is not making a statement about whether the self is bad, but about who we are most closely associated with. Self-denial for the Christian means renouncing oneself as the center of existence and recognizing Jesus as your new and true center. In other words, with self-denial or dying to self, our primary allegiance is to Jesus rather than to ourselves. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a famous quote he says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He's talking about dying to self. And probably the best commentary in scripture on dying to self is found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. My, my life verse. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> what, what does dying to self include? It includes several things. 
First of all, it includes denying your flesh the sinful desires that it seeks. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That the flesh is the old nature. Paul is saying that we are to put to death the old nature and its practices. What misdeeds are we to put to death? Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, <clears throat> beginning in verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Jumping down to verse 8, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, Paul says. And this is just a small sample of the types of sins that we are to deny the flesh. There are many more. In essence, anything that does not conform to God's moral will revealed in Scripture is a sin that must be put to death. Second, dying to self includes abandoning a personal control of your life. Our natural bent is to follow our vision, our dreams, our heart, and then periodically check behind us to make sure that Jesus is blessing what we've chosen. Often we say that we're following Jesus, but what we really want is Jesus following us. If we are to follow Jesus, we must deny, that is, say no to ourselves. Instead of placing hope in our plans and, and pressing on to achieve our goals, we are to put God first. We are to give up our right, our need to be the one setting the agenda and pass the mantle to Christ instead. Daryl Johnson has written, Jesus calls his followers to think of ourselves as already dead, to bury our hopes and dreams, to bury the plans and agendas we made for ourselves. He, he will either resurrect our dreams or replace them with dreams and plans of his own. This is a hard but liberating saying. Freedom comes when we lay down the ill-gotten false crown, when we say no, when we live as though the gods who are us have already died. Third, self-denial or dying to self includes setting aside your own interests. And perhaps the most significant way that we can practice self-denial is how we choose to relate to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, you don't always have to be first. You don't always have to be right. You don't always have to get your way. In fact, you must be willing to give up any and all rights that you think that you have. The right to be honored and served. The right to hold a grudge. The right to complain or gossip about someone else. The right to seek revenge. If you are unwilling to die to self, you cannot legitimately claim to be one of Christ's disciples. The second requirement that Jesus gives to those that would seek to be one of his disciples is that we must take up our cross. <clears throat> this is the, the first mention of the cross in Matthew's gospel. All of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, contain the saying of Jesus. <clears throat> Again, what does it mean to take up your cross? Let me suggest what it does not mean. I, I regularly hear people quote this verse to point to some burden that they must carry in their life, a strained relationship, a, a thankless job, a, a physical illness, or a cantankerous mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and with self-pitying pride, they say, that's my cross that I have to carry. But that's not what Jesus meant 
when he said, take up your cross. What Jesus is talking about here is the level, the extent to which we are to deny ourselves. But remember, Jesus made this statement before he was crucified. To Jesus' disciples and everybody else living in the first century AD, the cross meant one thing and one thing only, death by the most painful and humiliating means a human being could develop. 2,000 years later, Christians view the cross as a cherished symbol of atonement, forgiveness, grace, and love. But in Jesus' day, the cross represented nothing but tortuous death. And because the Romans forced convicted criminals to carry their own crosses to the place of crucifixion, bearing a cross meant carrying their execution device while facing ridicule along the way to death. The command to take up your cross therefore means to be willing to endure pain, shame, and persecution for Jesus' sake. What Jesus is referring to here is complete and total devotion to him, even unto death. On another occasion, Jesus said to a, a large crowd following him, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And at first glance, it would appear that Jesus is saying that we can't be his disciple unless we hate our family. But what we know from other New Testament verses that command us to love others, including our family members, that this can't be true. What then is Jesus saying? He's saying that we must be willing to give up everything for him. Following Jesus requires commitment and faithfulness, even if our parents, wife, children, or siblings choose not to follow him. If and when we are faced with the painful choice of loyalty to family versus loyalty to Jesus, we must choose Jesus, even if our family members disown us or worse for being Christians. We must follow Christ. And it is in this sense that we are hating our family. This is part of what it means to, to take up our cross. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus is recorded as saying that his disciples are to take up their cross daily. In other words, the call to discipleship is not a one-time event. It's a daily process. Each day, every moment of our lives, we need to choose to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. You know, following Jesus is easy when life runs smoothly. Our true commitment to him is revealed during times of suffering. And if you're wondering if you're ready to take up your cross, consider these questions. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? In some places of the world, these are not hypothetical questions. They are a reality. But notice the questions are phrased, are you willing? Following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean all, things, all of these things are going to happen to you. In our culture right now, most of them probably will not. But are you willing to take up your cross? If there comes a point in time, a point in your life when you're faced with a choice, Jesus or the comforts of this life, which will you choose? Jesus goes on to give three reasons why his disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross. The first reason is found in verse 25. 
You have to lose your life to save it. <clears throat> Again, Jesus says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. This paradoxical saying of Jesus is found in all four Gospels and in two Gospels more than once. Aside from the command, follow me, which we will look at in a couple of weeks, this saying is repeated more times in the Gospels than any other saying of Jesus. <clears throat> the person who wants to save his life refers to anyone who shrinks back from suffering for the cause of Christ, the person who is unwilling to take up their cross and follow him. Such a person is concerned with self-preservation. They seek their own well-being and would deny Christ rather than face trouble. This person is warned that they will lose the very thing they love and are most desirous to keep. Their own life will be forfeit. On the other hand, the person who loses their life refers to anyone who is willing to give up absolutely everything in this world, including life itself, for the sake of Christ and the gospel. Such a person dedicates themselves exclusively to God and his kingdom because they know that the reward is priceless. They have the promise of eternal life. Second, a second reason that Jesus gives for why we must deny ourselves and take up our cross. Verse 26, there is zero profit in gaining the whole world. Jesus asks a couple of rhetorical questions in this verse. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? <clears throat> when Jesus talks about gaining the whole world or, or seeking to gain the whole world, he's talking about all those things that could possibly be achieved and, or acquired in this life. Things such as possessions or position or pleasures or popularity. When he talks about their soul, he's talking about eternal life. And he's saying, who would give the whole world in exchange for their soul. When he uses that phrase, give in exchange, he's, he's using a business metaphor for traded transactions where one person gives up one thing for something else. And the idea is that nothing in this life, nothing is worth keeping if it means losing eternal life. Not wealth, not popularity, not success, not even pleasures in all of its shapes and forms. To trade the temporary for the eternal is foolishness. To live for the present is to lose God's best for the future. The third reason Jesus gives for why we need to deny ourselves and take up our cross is that those who deny themselves will be Rewarded, Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The question that I'm sure Jesus' disciples were thinking when Jesus was teaching them this is, you said that if we, if we lose our life, that we will find it. Well, when will we find it? If we deny it, Will we find it if we deny ourselves now, in the here and now, in the present? Or will we find it when you return at some point in the future? And while I believe that there is a sense in which we will find our life now, here, in the present, once we deny ourselves, the emphasis in this verse is finding our life when Jesus returns. At Christ's second coming, those who choose earthly pleasures over eternal ones will be judged. But those who choose God's way will be rewarded for their choices. Jesus' words in this section may be paraphrased as follows. The person who, when the issue is between me and what he considers to be his own interests, chooses the latter thinking that by doing so, he is going to find himself 
that is secure, a firmer hold on the full life, will be bitterly disappointed. He will lose rather than gain. His happiness and usefulness will shrink and shrivel rather than increase. At last he will perish everlastingly. On the other hand, the one who, confronted with the choice, gives himself away, that is, denies himself out of loyalty to me, being willing, if need be, to pay the ultimate sacrifice, will attain to complete self-realization. He will have life and will have it more abundantly until at last he will share with me the glory of my return and the new heaven and the new earth. Now, despite what some people may believe, discipleship is not a call to comfort and ease. It is a call to self-denial and suffering. A call to die to self and to bear a cross. That sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? It is. But only if you fail to consider how dying to self allows you to live fully in Christ. And we'll talk more about the full life in Christ next time. My concern is that there may be some here in the congregation today who have not accepted Jesus' call to die. You're still living for self. Christianity has met some felt need in your life Maybe a longing for community, a longing to belong, or an attempt to earn God's favor through religious activity. But you are unwilling to die to self and to take up your cross. Let me remind you that nobody can call himself or herself a disciple of Jesus Christ and at the same time follow their own path do things their own way, and ignore the life to which God has called them. Those who do not die to self and live for Jesus are not worthy of him. The issue of worthiness is a matter of choice. All must choose to die to themselves and live for Jesus alone or choose not to do it. To choose not to do so is to become unworthy of following him. Those who refuse make themselves unworthy because of their lack of total commitment to him. The choice is yours. What will you choose? For those who already have chosen to die to self and to live for Jesus, you know something about the abundant life that Jesus promises. But it has not been without its difficulties. It has not been void of suffering, be it some sort of pain or shame or persecution. Christian, if this describes you today, I want to leave you with these words of hope spoken by Jesus himself in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. He says, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. My friend, Jesus sees the suffering that you have been willing to endure for his sake. And he will make sure that you will be rewarded for the choices that you have made, both in this life and in the life to come. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I am concerned <clears throat> that in the church in America today that there are a number of professing Christians that have absolutely no clue of what it costs to be a disciple of Christ. They 
may have been persuaded to walk down an aisle, to pray a prayer of salvation, and then just go live their life any way that they want with the false assurance that they will spend eternity with you. This is a form of easy believism that the scriptures do not teach. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. But there is a cost involved. And you told your followers right up front what you expect of those who would follow him. We need to die to self. We need to take up our cross and we need to follow you. Not only is this contrary to <clears throat> what is being taught in many churches today, it certainly is countercultural to the way our society is living today. And so we are faced with a challenge, even if we desire to live this way, it seems impossible for us to do so. And yet, even though you expect this of your followers, you do not leave us to our own devices to do this on our own. You've given us your spirit to indwell us, to empower us, to live the life that you've called us to live. You've given us your word to give us guidance and instruction. You've given us one another for support and encouragement. May we rely on the resources that you've given us as we seek to live the life that you've called us to live, to die to self, to take up our cross, to follow you. And in doing so, that we would show and demonstrate our complete and total commitment and devotion to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we begin the year 2023, that we who call ourselves Christians would examine our lives to see whether or not we truly are committed to following you in the way that you demand. Those who are unwilling to die to self and to take up their cross and follow you, you say, cannot be your disciple. I pray that no one here today is deceiving themselves into thinking that they belong to you, that they are following you when in fact they are not. Spirit of God, work in our hearts. Show us where we need to think differently, where we need to change beginning today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.